Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share with you the management of our multiple myeloma patients at uh, King Abdul Aziz uh, Medical City in Riyadh, and that's specifically in the relation to the uh, stem cell transplant. So we do know that multiple myeloma is uh, a malignant proliferation of the plasma cells in the bone marrow, and that will lead to the production of um, abnormal proteins or monoclonal proteins, and that will be the, uh, the main uh, cause for the all abnormalities that happen in the disease later on. Now, multiple myeloma represents about 1% of, of all hematologicals and about 10% in hematological malignancies, and actually that can goes up to 17% uh, in the United States. The median age at the diagnosis, as we know, is in the mid-60s, and the early incidence is about 4 per 100,000. And despite all the novel agents, targeted therapy, all the new developments in the treatment, unfortunately, the disease remains un uncurable, with an annual mortality of about 3.4 per 100,000. So how common the disease in Saudi Arabia? This is a slide from the Saudi Cancer Registry showing the number of new cases of multiple myeloma uh, between uh, 1994 and 2012. And as you can see, there is sort of step rise in the number of cases detected year by year with a predominance of male over female gender. However, in some years, you see drop of the number of cases. And that's simply due to the lack of reporting those patients to the cancer registry, which is very important, all should be reported. Uh, another slide from the same registry showing the number of multiple uh, myeloma uh, new patients, but this is their age group. Uh, as you can see, the peak probably more above 70. However, there are cases reported at the age of 30 and 20s. So uh, we do know that the cancers in general do occur at a relatively younger age in the Middle East, and that is not an exception uh, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is a historical uh, photo showing uh, the first patient who underwent uh, autologous stem cell transplant in our unit. And this goes back to February 2010. Now, this boy, he did not have myeloma. He had transplant for relapsed Hodgkin disease or Hodgkin lymphoma. I think I'm missing one slide, supposed to show the transplant activity in the, in the center. And uh, this is uh, multiple myeloma and all the other diseases. And basically the total number has been done till June of this year is about 380 patients, with two thirds being allogenic stem cell transplants. I'm sorry, for some reason that slide has disappeared. But following that is the slide uh, which showing the our latest uh, uh, analysis of our survival cares in all transplants. And as you can see in the allogenic group, the five-year survival is 62.8, while in autologous is uh, five-year survival is 69.3. So that's about transplant generally at King Abdulaziz Medical City. So how about transplant in multiple myeloma patients? Again, there is another slide is missing. Uh, that showed the number of multiple myeloma patients transplanted since March 2011. So for about um, seven years, uh, we've done about 53 patients till February of this year. Um, and uh, 52, uh, sorry, 51 patients out of 53 were uh, autologous stem cell transplant and two patients underwent allogenic stem cell transplant. I'm sorry that slide is not shown, but I'm just trying to cover it by telling the contents of it. Uh, so the patient's characteristic, the median age for our transplanted myeloma patients was, uh, is 53 year old. And according to the age group, as you can see, nearly half of the patients, they were in the fifth decade between 40 and 50 years old, and that is relatively uh, younger than the um, uh, age uh, group uh, internationally. Now, the uh, distribution of the patients uh, by sex, about two-thirds 
of patients were male, underwent stem cell transplant, and one third female. Uh, the staging of the disease, and this is at the time of diagnosis, as you can see, uh, at least 70% of patients, they were already stage three in Dury Salmon, and were 44% at stage three of ISS scoring system. And these are rather high figures, because this will, we know, and it's evidence-based, that the outcome of transplant, or measurement of myeloma generally, uh, the, the, the staging of the disease at the time of, of diagnosis had a major impact on it. So this is showing patients, they come to us rather late, or an advanced stage of the disease. Now, out of 53 patients, 48 patients, they were transplanted for the first time, while five patients, they had previous transplant. And that's being uh, O2, then relapsed, they went for ALO, or second O2, a bone relapse. Uh, so five patients, they underwent the transplant for the second time. The uh, LDH and creatinine, the mean level was just above the normal range for both, uh, figure, for both variables. And three out of the 53 patients, they were transplanted while they are on regular hemodialysis. The subtype of the paraproteins, 33% uh, were IgG kappa, and that goes down um, uh, by order to light chain kappa, IgG lambda, IgA, uh, IgA lambda kappa, uh, light chain lambda. Plasma cell leukemia, we had two patients underwent transplant, and also we did two patients of Boehm syndrome as part of the uh, plasma cell dyscrasia, and one, uh, one patient underwent O2 for primary amyloidosis. Uh, the cytogenetics were 50%, 55% of patients, they had normal cytogenetics, and the 45% were the abnormal, and that is scattered between uh, standard risk and high risk. There were four patients, unfortunately, we did not have the uh, cytogenetic analysis, and simply these patients came to us from other uh, centers where I uh, assume this, the facilities of cytogenetics at the time of diagnosis was not there, so obviously we had no way to find out pre-treatment, what was the risk stratification by cytogenetics. Uh, the disease assessment pre-transplant, 60% uh, of patients they were in stringent CR, and the rest were scattered or uh, divided equally between CR, VGPR, and PR. Uh, so the induction regimen uh, for the transplant, uh, our standard uh, of care is the VCD protocol. So 31 patients, they had VCD uh, induction. And you can see there is uh, quite a few other patients received different treatment, um, mainly VRD, VTD, VD. You will note at the right hand of the slide that some patients, they had even melphalan and talid, uh, tal uh, taldex. And again, these patients were treated somewhere else then relapsed, then referred to us for transplant. But our standard of practice is use VCD. Maybe lately, over the last a year, I guess, we start moving towards VRD rather than VD. But still, VCD represents the majority of the patients. Uh, our uh, mobilization uh, protocol is uh, mobilized with G uh, uh, cyclophosphamide. However, uh, Three, five patients, they did not receive cyclophosphamide simply because of the renal impairment. And one patient was mobilized only with Mosebel. And the reason for this, this patient is happened to be a sickle cell disease. Therefore, we try to avoid using GCSF as a mobilization. The uh, mean of uh, CD34 uh, dose was 5.9 million per kilogram. And the conditional regimen uh, most of the patients, 44 out of 53, we use melphalan standard dose 200. Seven patients, they use the smaller dose of 140, again, uh, because of the renal uh, impairment, or the other possibility if it is the second transplant. So these are the reasons why patients were given 140 uh, per meter square rather than 200. And the other two uh, condition regimens, these for the two patients who received allogenic stem cell transplant. So this is a reduced intensity conditioning. One was FluPU ATG, and that was within uh, a local study in our department. And the second one has um, 
reduced intensity uh, flu uh, melphalan. The, uh, the median uh, time for the uh, engraftment um, in A and C was about 12.5 days, and in platelets was about 13.5. On the right-hand side slide, the last column you see NA, and those five patients, they, they, never, they never dipped their platelets count. So always remains above 20, therefore, uh, that was not taken in consideration for the uh, identifying the engraftment for, the, uh, for those patients. Okay, so what was the adverse events, the main adverse effects, ev events we faced with these patients or complications? Mucositis is very common. Most of the patients, 49 out of 55, they developed mucosites. Obviously, more uh, clear or more obvious the side effects with the patients who underwent conditioning with 200 milligram per meter square. So it's quite common um, uh, adverse event. Uh, diarrhea, again, is part of the side effects of melphalan specifically. So 41 patients developed uh, diarrhea. However, uh, only uh, four patients, they had positive stool culture, i.e. as an effective cause of diarrhea, only four patients, and 33, uh, 37 patients were uh, negative stool culture. Now, negative stool culture obviously does not rule out an infection, but at least we were not able to identify the uh, causing organism. Uh, febrile neutropenia is quite common, as you'd uh, expect, being um, heavy chemotherapy. So 44 patients out of 53, they at, uh, sustained at some stage during their transplant admission an episode of febrile neutropenia. Uh, blood cultures were positive in 13 patients out of those uh, had the infection or the fever. And out of the 13 positive culture, um, Klebsiella and Pseudomonas on the right-hand side of the slide you can see is probably the highest uh, organisms, but also patients that had Serratia, uh, Salmonella, Staph aureus, Strep, E. coli, Campylobacter, and, uh, and all of it. Now, the li central line infection was reported in six patients out of 53, and three of those patients, they needed to go to ICU at some stage during their febrile neutropenia period. The rest were managed uh, um, on the general ward. Uh, changes in the liver and uh, in the liver function test and the renal profile was, uh, was documented. Three patients, uh, they had a normal kidney function at the beginning of transplant. During the berry transplant period, they developed renal impairment and only one patient with a normal baseline liver function test had changed in the liver function. There were other, uh, can call it non-specific complications, or not expected at least, uh, peripheral neuropathy, which I will assume most likely in the patients who had velcate induction, in induction, uh, esophagitis, pancreatitis, uh, and, and uh, other infections. Now, interestingly, one patient developed uh, drop of the platelets, and this was labeled as ITP, I assume, uh, because there was, no, there's, there was no clear drop in the rest of the count uh, at the same time, or maybe the patient has, uh, did not re, uh, has responded to IV, IG, or maybe he did not have an increment on platelet transfusion. Therefore, on clinical ground, uh, this was considered as an immune-mediated thrombocytopenia. Hepatitis 3 activation was also um, uh, reported in one patient. So what was the outcome of transplanting these 53 uh, patients? Okay, day 100 post um, transplant, uh, looking at the response uh, or response rate, uh, CR was uh, documented in 40 patients out of 53. Four patients, they uh, recommended SCR, uh, stringent CR, and the rest was between VGBR, BR, or uh, disease progression. There was one patient who died during the first 100 days, and I'll mention that later in the next, in the, uh, next few slides. And also the relapse. The relapse, patients could documented the relapse post-transplant, and this is not only in the first 100 days, this is still the time of, of look, or viewing these cases. There were 15 patients uh, confirmed relapse and 38 uh, didn't. Now, maybe you'll be 
questioning, is this really um, a real number? It sounds a small number compared to the size of the group, but I can um, tell you the reasons could be of the still shortfall up of the lately transplanted patients. Or the other issue, which probably should be discussed uh, whether in this session or further on, uh, later on, is the use of maintenance in multiple myeloma. Anyway, 15 patients documented to be relapsed, and the median period of relapse was 330 days, so nearly one year, within one year. Now, we looked into those 15 patients uh, in a little bit more detail, trying to find out if there's anything in common between these patients, and we found that the median age of these patients were 50. Now, the median age of all patients was 53, so slightly younger. Cytogenetic uh, uh, risk, 14 out of 15, they had high risk uh, cytogenetics, and only one patient who had standard risk. Staged by um, Dury Salmon uh, scoring system, seven or half of the patients, they were uh, or they presented at a late stage of the disease or stage three. The paraprotein subtype, I'm not sure if that makes a difference or not, but uh, one third of the patients, they have IgG kappa, and the rest uh, was between um, IgG lambda, light chain kappa, plasma cell leukemia, both of them, both of the cases, or both patients, plasma cell leukemia relapsed, and IgA lambda, there was one patient. Uh, further analysis of those relapsed patients, the disease status of pre-transplant, which is, I think it's important, and half of the patient, they were in partial remission. So only two patients uh, who had uh, stringent CR or CR has relapsed, while half of them, they were in partial remission. The CT CD34 dose probably uh, has no major impact, as the number is almost the same as the um, uh, uh, the median number for the whole group, which is 5.2 uh, million uh, cells per kilogram. The induction regimen, VCD patients, 10 of them, they relapsed, and the maintenance used, despite uh, nine patients, they were on maintenance linolidomide, still they managed to relapse. So looking into the overall mortality, um, 10 patients since the date of transplant, Still uh, reviewing the cases, 10 patients died, and the median uh, time uh, to the occurrence of death was 497 days. Again, another slide is missing, which is the details of those 10 patients died. One of them died in day um, in the first 100 days, so that considered to be transplant-related mortality, and the rest. The cause of death was uh, between uh, disease relapse, uh, septic shock, and there were other factors. Uh, I'm sorry for this. I don't know why some slides are missing, but I try to cover. Now, the, uh, the days post-transplant uh, till the uh, preparation of this um, review, it's um, 585 days since the day of transplant. That's for the whole group. And now we're coming to the survival overall survival, there are two graphs here. The one on the left-hand side, this is the overall survival over five years in the first group of these patients. We analyzed them about two years ago, and you can see the overall survival in five years. Uh, uh, sorry, that's the right, right side curve. Uh, le yeah, left side curve. And the overall survival is about 65% uh, uh, over five years. Now, when we extended the group and uh, went up to the uh, 2018, and including the new patients, so the follow-up became up to 80 months, and as you can see, the overall survival has dropped to around uh, 40%. Now, progression-free survival at five years, again, that was looked at the first group of patients, um, 28 patients out of the 53, and that's in the first five years, and you can see the patients who were in CR, pre-transplant, the uh, overall survival at five years, was better uh, significantly compared to the patients who were in BR or VGPR. Progression-free survival, again, was looked at over five years uh, in two groups um, who received the maintenance and who did not receive the maintenance. And, and as you can see from the red line on the right-hand side slide, uh, the red-colored uh, line, that the um, progression-free survival was significantly better on these patients who received uh, maintenance. Now, so far, how are we doing? Looking to the international um, 
data or uh, international center uh, work. I put these two slides to compare our care, looking at the, the, the overall survival between 2011-2018, compared with the uh, CIPMTR, and I, I showed you this slide earlier, so the, the um, survival curve at, at five years is about 65-66%. Uh, now compared to the C, um, CIPMTR, this look at into the uh, survival over decades, and I assume the first, um, uh, the first, decade, first two decades at least, the um, um, novel agents and maintenance therapy is not well established, and therefore you can see, looking to the uh, last decade between, uh, or last um, period between 2013 and 2015, the survival is much better. However, I think the follow-up period remains uh, shorter. Therefore, I think this should be taken in consideration. So if you compare our results, I don't think we are too far uh, from the international um, uh, level. Uh, so in summary, um, multiple myeloma remains, remains an in, incurable disease despite the new uh, novel agents uh, and also adding to the uh, improvement in the transplant uh, treatment. The median age of our patients is uh, younger than the patients what we uh, normally, see, normally know in the West. A uh, significant number of patients are already uh, in advanced stage by, uh, of the disease by the time of diagnosis and all our patients receive it single rather than tandem transplant. So we never, um, we never done or we don't do tandem transplant routinely. However, some patients went for the second transplant because of disease relapse or, uh, or uh, uh, plasma cell leukemia. They had the first transplant was O2, then um, um, consolidated with allergenic stem cell transplant. In our small group of patients, survival care looks matching the international ones. However, a conclusion has to be taken with caution due to the small uh, size sample and probably or relatively short duration of follow-up. I think we need more standardization of both autologous stem cell transplant consolidation and maintenance protocol. Now, after I reviewed these patients, I think there are a few challenges in improving the outcome of treating uh, myeloma patients, especially with transplants, and I put them in a few points. I think the first one is the early diagnosis. It's very important to pick up these patients early because we know the delay of diagnosis will have an impact on the outcome. Outpatient stem cell transplant, as a matter of fact, we have started this over the last few months. So our recent patients, they get transplanted. Uh, I'm talking about auto, obviously. Uh, they get transplanted as an outpatient basis, and that has a uh, big um, impact on the bed availability and the resources of the institution. Uh, we have not standardized the MRD in multiple myeloma comparing to the leukemias, but that's something I think uh, is a challenge and that needs to be looked at uh, in near future. Maintenance protocols, most of the patients they had, as I said, um, received lenalidomide, but we do know uh, other agents can be used, especially for higher risk uh, patients, especially uh, bortezomib or, or Velcade. And the last point is single versus tandem transplant. Our standard practice is single uh, transplant, but we do know um, that tandem transplant has been proved um, effective, especially in the patient who uh, have achieved a response after the first plant, uh, transplant or a patient who had high risk. I think these uh, points consider or, or, or should be a challenge for us to improve the outcome of managing our myeloma patient with stem cell transplantation. And this will be my slides, and thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I would like to thank my colleagues who helped me in uh, collecting the data. The names are there, and uh, the analysis, uh, and special thank to the division. There are two photos here, historical photos. The first one, when we had the transplant in early days, and the second one is the most recent team doing transplant. Thank you very much.